So it's time to introduce an important concept in Wilsonian um, idealist or liberal theory, this idea of collective security and how we can potentially stabilize the international system through cooperation. Uh, when we think about collective security, there's a couple different ways to think about it. Um, there's this sort of idea of alliances of states working together, forming security relationships that are going to enhance each other's security, right? So the idea of the NATO alliance is, you know, a couple dozen states that have banded together and have committed to work together and train together to provide a common front that can defend against foreign aggression. An attack on one is an attack on all. And now increasingly, at least since September 11th, there's been a, a movement in NATO to launch offensive actions against states that are a threat to international peace and stability. Um, and that alliance creates cooperation. And while alliances have been around for hundreds and hundreds of years, um, they're, not tip they're not exactly what we're talking about when we talk about collective security, because as states form alliances and they increase their own security, that collective security for those in the alliance can actually exacerbate a sense of insecurity for states that are outside the alliance. And so again, returning to that NATO alliance, in the early 1990s with the collapse of the Soviet Union and the Soviet Empire in Eastern Europe, NATO builds this organization called the Partnership for Peace to sort of extend cooperation into the former Warsaw Pact in Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union. And states that were part of the Soviet Union or part of the Eastern um, Empire of the Soviet Union um, slowly became, become members of NATO and NATO's sort of border sort of moves eastward to bump up against Russia with the inclusion of uh, the Baltics, Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia. And as NATO moves eastward, um, Russia's sense of fear and insecurity of being surrounded and encroached upon um, escalates. And so this is a, a pretty common phenomenon with alliances that as states cooperate for their own security, they can exacerbate the insecurity of others. The idea of collective security, as it was put forward by Wilson, is this idea that rather than having separate alliances that are going to have their own internal security systems, we create a global security system in which states are cooperating to ensure that all states are protected against aggression um, and that we have sort of a unified NATO type thinking of an attack on one as an attack on all. So thinking about the, the implementation efforts of collective security. Um, Woodrow Wilson puts this idea forward as part of his 14 points. The League of Nations is founded on this principle of collective security, that there'll be a, an international organization that will be committed to confronting aggressive states, and that it will prevent you know, this, a, a second world war and, a, and great power politics. Um, the League of Nations oftentimes gets sort of um, poked at as being ineffectual. And there's a couple things that are maybe going on here. Um, on the, the most obvious would be that it was created to stop World War II, and yet we had World War II. And so clearly something wasn't working within the League of Nations. Um, on the other hand, there were dozens of smaller scale crises between the end of World War I and the start of World War II. And the League of Nations deployed peacekeepers and conducted operations and negotiated and mediated and managed dozens of these crises in that time period. But its decision-making structure was limited. Uh, there was an executive committee of the um, Security Council or of the um, League of Nations. And in order to take robust action, it required um, unanimity all the members of that executive committee had to be in agreement for the League of Nations to be able to take action. And so what happens is that when Japan moves into China and invades Manchuria, um, it's a pretty clear cut case of aggression. Um, the League of Nations is sort of stuck. They don't know how to move forward. They send a delegation to investigate. Um, they come back saying that, yes, okay, so Japan did invade um, Manchuria, but there may have been provocation. It may have been that a railroad track that was being built by Japan was sabotaged. We're not sure if it was sabotaged by somebody opposed to Japan or if Japan did it itself, but either way, um, it's kind of messy and we're not sure what to say. And so it was a really wishy-washy report, uh, but even that was enough for Japan to storm out along with Nazi Germany, uh, denouncing the League of Nations and essentially ending the organization as, as an effective organization. Um, so after the League of Nations collapses in World War II, uh, the United States under President 
uh, Roosevelt puts forward a new plan for building a collective security system around the United Nations. And so the idea is that you're going to have a streamlined decision process, right, where you're not going to have a unanimity requirement to get anything done. Um, and the, uh, Roosevelt argues for the creation of a security council in which the powerful states of the international system are all at the table together so that they can essentially drive forward international agreements. And so as Roosevelt was explaining this to Stalin at the Yalta conference. He said, okay, so there'll be this security council that will make these big decisions about enforcing collective security, but we'll be at the table. The United States, Great Britain, France, um, China, and the Soviet Union will all be at the table together and we'll have a veto. So if something is you know, clearly objectionable, we'll be able to, to stop it. And Stalin sort of speculates and says, well, what would happen if perhaps one of the, the powerful P5 permanent members of the Security Council with a veto was to be involved in, let's say, aggression against their neighbors? And Roosevelt responded, no, 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 that would never happen because these five states, as the victors of World War II, as the states that are committed to international peace and stability and security, they would never be aggressor states. Um, so even in that sort of initial plan for how to build a collective security system, there was maybe a hint that things were not going to be all that much more effective than the League of Nations. Um, we still run into another problem that, you know, plagued the League of Nations with identifying whether Japan had, you know, it, been outside of its rights and outside of, um, of international law and invading China. We just sometimes have a hard time identifying who's the aggressor in these sorts of conflicts. So let me walk through a couple successful examples of um, collective security in action. Uh, I can find two. So in the 1950s, uh, there's an agreement um, over the future of the Korean Peninsula, which had been occupied by Japan. Um, it's divided into a North and South region, the South being occupied by the United States, the North being occupied by the Soviet Union. Um, the United States and Soviet Union withdraw. As they withdraw, the Soviet Union leaves behind all of their military equipment, and the Communist Party of North Korea picks up that military equipment and invades the South. Um, they almost overrun the whole of South Korea. The United Nations meets, they vote, they authorize military action to basically drive North Korea out of South Korea, um, and an international force, which is predominantly an Anglo American force, something like 94% is US forces along with British, Canadian, um, Australian, and New Zealand forces um, land in South Korea and are able to drive North Korea back to the northern part of the Korean Peninsula. I think it's interesting if we look at the politics of the, um, the Korean War and, and what got that authorization through the Security Council. Um, at that particular moment, the Soviet Union is boycotting the Security Council, and so they're not there to cast a veto. The other state with an interest in the future of the Korean Peninsula is China, but the Chinese vote at the Security Council had been held by the Chinese nationalists. The Chinese nationalists have been driven from China. They flee to Taiwan. And so although China is you know, a big, powerful state sitting on the border with North Korea and clearly opposed to um, the US operations in North Korea, um, the Chinese veto at the United Nations is held by the, the Chinese nationalists in Taiwan. And so it's able to be passed through. The Soviet Union rushes back in, they end their boycott, and every subsequent resolution to try to deal with the Korean um, war and the Korean conflict ends up getting vetoed by the Soviet Union. So it was at this sort of weird moment where powerful states weren't able to, to check each other. And it's sort of at this weird moment where the United States is willing to commit the vast majority of the military forces to make collective security work. We see another example in 1990 when Iraq invades Kuwait. Um, again, the United Nations looks at this as this is a clear-cut violation. One state's attacking another. A Security Council authorization goes through, authorizing military force to push Iraq out of Kuwait. Um, George Bush Sr. mobilizes a coalition. This time it's only about 90% U.S. forces, but there's a coalition of European and um, Arab states that move in and drive Saddam Hussein from Kuwait. Um, the Soviet Union doesn't exercise its veto as it typically would have because the Soviet Union is going through a period of um, political and economic upheaval. It's on the brink of collapse and the 
the Soviet leader, Mikhail Gorbachev, looks at this and says, you know what, this is not a problem. We're not going to deal with this right now. We're stepping back from the world stage. Do whatever you want. And so they don't veto the action. Um, and George W. H.W. Uh, Bush looks at this and says, um, this is how collective security is supposed to work. This is what Wilson and Roosevelt were talking about. This is the start of a new world order where collective security is going to, to function and the fear and insecurity that comes with an anarchic system is going to be mitigated. I think that optimism was probably um, a bit overstated there are at least two really significant problems with collective security um, in, in terms of how it operates today. Um, one of those is that it's oftentimes really difficult to know who the aggressor is. So the Korean War and the Iraq invasion of Kuwait, both of those were clear-cut situations where one state just launches an invasion of another state. But oftentimes it's a little messier. So I would point to the Iran-Iraq War from the 1980s. I'm not really sure who is ultimately responsible for that conflict, who I would blame as the aggressor in that conflict, right? Because on one hand, Iraq does invade Iran, right? So they're, they're launching an invasion. Um, maybe they saw an opportunity uh, with the Iranian revolution. Iran has lost support from the United States, its primary weapons backer. It's isolating the international system. It can't get military parts to rebuild its aircraft and, and maintain its military. And so maybe Saddam Hussein is, you know, a greedy megalomaniac, sees an opportunity to, to, to conquer his neighbor. Um, that would be a clear cut case of aggression, except in the lead up to that invasion, um, Iran was seeking to spread its revolution to the Shia in Iraq and was launch, was was supporting militant groups and was launching assassination attempts on Saddam Hussein. And so you could also make a case that Iran was provoking an attack or potentially trying to destabilize its neighbor. I don't know who to blame and I don't know who should get international support in that situation. And that's actually pretty common. Oftentimes war doesn't break out because one side just is an outright aggressor. Oftentimes there's sort of a back and forth escalation and it can be difficult to know who's really to blame. A second problem is that essentially what Stalin anticipated, what happens if one of the permanent five members of the Security Council with a veto is an aggressor state? And this has happened repeatedly, right? So in the 1970s, the Soviet Union invades Afghanistan. In 2003, the United States invades Iraq. In the lead up to the Iraq invasion, there was a furious debate at the Security Council over whether or not the Security Council should authorize the United States to invade Iraq. But after the United States invaded Iraq, there was no subsequent debate about whether or not the United States should be confronted by the international community and thrown out of Iraq. Um, that kind of collective security simply didn't exist because of the US's position in the international system and because of its veto in the Security Council. Similarly, Russia in 2007 invades Georgia. Um, Russia seizes territory from Crimea. Um, there's just really no mechanism to respond when one of the permanent members of the Security Council um, is involved in, in, in an invasion. And therefore, this idea that collective security is going to allow everybody to take a deep sigh of relief and lower their fear that comes with anarchy, I'm not sure that that's really um, functioning quite the way that Wilson anticipated. <clears throat> 